He worked for the village of Highland Falls for 22 years. Good years. Uh, a great employee. Um, when he left, we missed him and still do. So, again, Neil passed after he retired. He uh, left us in 2001. So, after he left here, he worked at the golf course in West Point and a couple of other places. He was just a good guy. Uh, Phyllis Murphy. Uh, Bobby G, Robert G, and George Patterson. And let's also, as we always do, remember our men and women in the armed forces and those that have been affected uh, to the point where some of them have passed from COVID. Folks are first, so that we, because the room is limited with people, and we're probably just about over. So you're on. Yeah. Well, let me just say thank you to uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you for letting us uh, present, and thank you to the board for hearing us out. Um, I'm involved with a, a, a group called the Citizens Environmental Advisory Committee. And uh, among the many things that we've been looking at is uh, ways to uh, save energy, be more efficient with energy. And one of the programs the state is, is uh, actively supporting is called uh, uh, Community Choice Aggregation, which is uh, a pro process by which citizens can actually save money on energy sources and uh, go green. Uh, but uh, what, what I'd like to present is uh, Jeff Duhansky, who is the uh, director of Hudson Valley Energy, and he really is like the go-to person for information on community choice aggregation. He's worked with almost all or all of the municipalities in Hudson Valley that have chosen to go with, the, with this program. Uh, we call it CCA. So um, Jeff will explain everything, and I hope uh, the board will take advantage of his knowledge and really get all your questions answered at this point. But we'll follow up as needed. But anyway, I'll turn it over to Jeff. Thank you so much, Olga. So I'll stand right over here so I can kind of put my back to nobody. Um, yes, thank you very much for having me here tonight. I am Jeff Demansky. Um, I gave you more than you need on these eight slides that are part of the handouts and the two pages that I gave you, and I have extra copies there. Need one more? Yes. Oh. Just give us that. Yes. And I'll walk you through quickly what's in the slides, and I probably won't speak at length about, um, about the majority of the slides. Uh, but I will just start giving my background. I am, I am Jeff Demansky. I'm the, uh, the executive director of a nonprofit, the director of the Hudson Valley Energy Program, and we are a nonprofit organization um, that's been in New York State since 1996. Um, I've been the executive director doing this program, the, the Community Choice Aggregation Programs, um, for over two years now. And I'm from Orange County originally. My parents are still up in Chester in the middle of Orange County. Um, I went off to the Environmental Science and Forestry School and studied atmospheric chemistry. Um, served in the U.S. Peace Corps after that. Um, kind of focused my career on, on helping decision makers understand technical environmental opportunities and challenges. And that's for the 30 years of my career, which included working at um, an environmental planning firm based out of New York City that serves a number of communities in the Hudson Valley. Um, as, a, as a director of sustainability at Princeton University, um, at Mission and Wakefield as, as Director of Sustainability. It's all been very much the same focus of really serving as a program person, helping people take advantage of good opportunities. That can be kind of overwhelming. Um, and I'll say that community choice aggregation is, in this 30-year career that's had lots of good things in it, probably the most exciting thing for me because of the magnitude of the impact that it has and the fact that it does bring such a win-win-win benefit to the, to, the, um, 
to the municipalities that get involved with it. Um, and so that has been the focus. So what I have on the slides, um, the first slide, the top of the first page, just the overview of the contents, where I do have a 101 of understanding what is community choice aggregation, or as Olga said, CCA. And then for understanding the, some detail, I have a couple of slides about what the programs that we're doing here in the Hudson Valley. That's the second bullet, the Jewel Hudson Valley CCA programs. And I'll explain what Jewel is or who Jewel is. And then there's a, a second to last slide is the, the next steps for new communities. And I'll probably talk mostly about the second slide and the second to last slide. So about what is CCA and then what the steps are for communities to do CCA. So jumping into what is community choice aggregation. CCA is an opportunity for municipalities, as it described in that one simple sentence. It's a policy that allows cities and towns and villages in New York to act on behalf of the members of their community to source energy. And for us, it's really just a focus on electricity uh, because we, my organization and the team that I'm partnered with, are really focused on bringing enhanced environmental benefits coupled with cost savings through this program. So it's a policy in the state that you can do energy sourcing for gas and electric, but again for us, this is a way that towns and cities and villages can source electricity to bring benefit to the members of their community. And it says in, this, in the middle of that, the bottom of the page, the second slide, it's based on the same opportunity that was created in New York State in the late 1990s by deregulation. And that is when they broke up the monopoly that the utilities had, whereby the utility companies are just energy delivery companies since the late 1990s, meaning they make their money, just like FedEx and UPS, by getting products to their customers. In this case, the product is electricity for our focus. That created a whole marketplace where dozens and dozens of companies have registered in the state to offer people an alternative supply source opportunity. And you might have heard of many of these companies, and maybe and what I've discovered is many people have had their own personal experiences or know somebody who has with sourcing alternative supply for electricity. Companies like Green Mountain Energy or Ambit, Meridian, there's dozens of them out there. There are two reasons that people have gone into that alternative marketplace. One, typically, is to save money on electricity, to get a better supply rate for cost of electricity than they were paying the utility company. So just focus on cost. The second reason that people have gone into that supply marketplace is to support renewable or greener energy. The two of those did not go together. And, and well, to, to date, as an individual customer, you can't combine those two things, supporting renewable power and saving money. That is, in essence, what CCA has allowed, though, is the combination of the ability to source electricity that's 100% renewable and be cost competitive with what people had been paying for the utility company to make that decision for them for non-renewable power. So it's a, it's a focused on sourcing renewables in a program that is an alternative opportunity to one, the state default is if you make no choice, the utility company will make that choice for you as a pass-through, they make no money on it, or going into the private marketplace. So CCA brings this together as an opportunity. Because, significantly, because it is a program enabled by the state that is structured as a public benefit, it is allowed to operate if it's launched by a community, it's allowed to operate as an opt-out program. Meaning, the town launches it, and everybody who had the utility making their supply decision for them is automatically included in the program. It's that aspect of the program that gives it the, the power of the numbers that allows it to work. Because of that, it's very essential by, and it is a state-enabled program overseen by the Public Service Commission, that there be significant amounts of outreach and understanding. And so that is what my organization, my nonprofit, was brought into the team of an administrator of the program to do. So throughout the life of the program, not just for the launch period, but throughout the life of the program, there, there is an organization that is focused on su supporting the community to understand what the opportunity is, and to make it easy for them to get in or out of the program, which they can do at any time with no cost. So it's ongoing education, out, ongoing outreach, out in support, and support in, in 
taking advantage or deciding not to take advantage of the program. So that is, in essence, what my organization does and how the program is structured. Are there any, that's really the basics of how, of what CCA is. I'm going to stop for a second to ask questions, but I'll just, I'll go into the third slide, which is the top of the back of the, back of the first page. The why CCA, what are the program benefits? And this is when I spoke about there being a win-win-win scenario. There are wins in terms of the environmental benefits that, are, that come from the program. The rates, the cost, and I talk about program rates as being a benefit, so the idea of bringing the, win, the, the cost for environmental together with the cost. But third, and definitely not least, and it's what I found is to be the most prolifically important for most communities and most people who take advantage of it, are the consumer protection aspects of it. So, in terms of the environmental, We've been working now, um, since the loss of this year, we've been working with more than um, 16 communities in the Hudson Valley, including 10 communities in central Hudson Territory that I have them all listed on one of those upcoming slides so you can see which communities we've worked with, um, since the middle of 2019. And collectively, it represents, with all 16 communities, more than 55,000 households, the majority of which, 90% plus of those households, all went with the default choice of 100% New York sourced electricity for the program. Because of that, since the time we launched the program just last year, more than 200,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions have been avoided, which has very powerful impacts on the New York State grid. So this is such a very simple, simple in so many terms way of having a very powerful environmental impact moving us in the direction that the state has determined we need to go in terms of addressing some of the environmental challenges before us. It is a key part of two programs that the state has for cities and towns and villages as well. And to have those under the environmental section, there's two programs that I will not go into at length, but by doing a community choice aggregation program, you get significant points as part of the Climate Smart Communities program and the Clean Energy Communities Program. And these programs are both about, to, this, the new version of these programs are going to be announced very soon, this year, by the state. And they come with significant grant dollar opportunities as well. And so CCA is a very big leg up towards getting towards cost, no cost share grant dollars for those, from those programs. So, uh, the, the two points for program rates, again, this is competitive with what people have been paying the utility for non-renewables through this program. And it is certainly an absolute benefit compared to what people could pay on their own, would pay on their own for 100% renewables as an individual customer. So it's the Costco model benefit. By the town doing this on their behalf, they get the benefit of bulk buying, in essence. The consumer protection aspects of it, there are no contracts for the members of the communities. Unlike what they do it themselves, there's no restrictions, no contracts. They can opt in, opt out of the program at any time. It is a fixed rate that is obtained, so there's no funny business about potentially changeable rates. It's for a fixed period of time. When we, get, when we do these contracts with a supplier that we collectively select, for example, the programs that we've done to date have all been two-year contracts. So people know exactly how long it is, and they're not stuck in an endless situation that they have to monitor or worry about getting away from them. And lastly, there is a lot of support. Constant outreach, education, ability to ask questions, and, and support in getting in or out of the program. So that is why somebody would do the program. The next slide, I talk about the team. But before I do that, I will stop here. So before hitting with too much, are there questions that I could answer before I go further? Just, I have, I have a yes. question on, um, for the municipality yes. that should happen to agree and say, hey, listen, we have interest. Is there a percentage of the households in which must comply to? Or no. no, no, there's not. There is, because it is a buying club model, and to have leverage in the marketplace, an aggregation, you know, to break down what the word means, it's community choice aggregation. Okay. So communities do aggregate together to have enough meters collectively in that aggregation so that the suppliers know that they, they can be competitive. That you this, were this saying is, that that bulk rate. Right. Um, but, and, and so we do aggregate communities together. And wonderfully, we are aggregating even more communities that are not mentioned in the presentation already for a new aggregation. And so it's on the team to build enough 
communities together to do it. Okay. But once the program launches, the supplier bids knowing how the program works, that roughly 5 to 10 percent of people will opt out. And historically, with lots of experience, 90 percent of people stay in the program, and they know that. Just that's the way it works. So that's enough confidence for them to do it. But if for some reason everyone chose to opt out except one person, they're locked into an agreement where they have to give that rate to that one person in that community. Okay. So it doesn't matter. There's no, there's no burden on the communities to make sure there's enough to begin with or to keep people in the program. <coughs> yes, question. Um, so do you know who the default right now is for O&R that supplies our energy? There's not one supplier. They source on the open marketplace you know, several suppliers to meet up for their whole community demand, or their whole customer base demand. And right now from o &R, we can we have that option to choose different ones. There are private companies, yes. There's dozens and dozens in the state that you can choose from. Direct Energy is one. Direct Energy is one of the registered I think companies. Mine. Oh, so you have probably I a private... So, yeah. Yes. And actually, Direct Energy is one that we picked for the, the Central Hudson program that launched last year. But so, that, so that's where you opt into a program, through o &R, right now. Yes, well, right? and, yes, and yes. Just hear me out. So uh, I appreciate your presentation. Um, so with that being said, uh, after two years, what if the municipality, because I'm seeing, you know, an example would be two years, right. right? What if the municipality wanted to opt out at that point in time? How difficult would that be? After two years? Yeah, was, all right, so we opt in. Everybody opts in, well, the municipality opts in, people that don't want it, they opt out. Right. After two years, the, there's enough uproar in the community where they say, you know what, we don't want to do this anymore. We don't want to be, you know, told by the government that this is what we have to do. Right. And the government, how, how could the government opt out at that point in time if they are allowed They to don't do have it? to opt out because the contract is a bit for the municipality. It's a tri-party contract when the, when the program launches between the municipality, between the administrator, who is, who is Jewel, the, t the, part, the organization that chose me to be part of this, and the supplier. So in that two-year agreement, the municipality's in, but by state requirement, if, they're, if they want to go beyond two years, if they want to do it again, mm -hmm. they have to repeat the whole process. Oh, okay. So the municipality is free and clear to walk away at that point in time. Yeah, I'm just saying, that would be like the worst case scenario. Yeah, you sure. know what, I'm, I'm just, that's why I'm asking that yeah. question. Uh, another thing that uh, I noted that you said was about the Climate Smart Energy Program and some grants. Right. What can those grants be used for? At, or if you don't know, that's okay too. They've historically, the, the state, just to use it for the agency that does it, has typically wanted them to be used for more climate smart environmental or energy projects. But there's a good deal, of, there has been a good deal of creativity within that, and there's a lot more that I know is coming out with the requirements for how those grants are used coming forward. So it could be anything from pedestrian strategies to solar, appliance changes to, yeah. Electric, solar panels for, could our, be, absolutely. for our lighting, yep. for parking lots. Yes. Things like that. Yep. that those that are examples that have, they have been used that for. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. Feasibility studies for like in Beacon, we put it towards a feasibility study to look at uh, inline hydropower. So, yeah, lots of opportunities. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Yes. Oh, you first. <clears throat> so, like the mayor mentioned, he already has a independent supplier. Yes. What would that do to his agreement with that supplier right now if you went to? Yes. This so, if the town launches, mm -hmm. all of the eligible customers to be included in the opt-out model mm -hmm. are given to our team by the utility company, by Orange and Rockland. That does not include anyone who has a current contract. So we don't kick anybody out of their contract. If you have a current supply contract, you're automatically opted out. If you are on a bill pay assistance program, you're automatically opted out. If you put a block on your account because you're annoyed by those companies, which have been very annoying to a lot of people, <laughs> which is why this program is important, you're automatically opted out too. Anybody, though, can, and we always encourage people to look carefully to make sure there's no prohibitive fees. Anybody could end their agreement and opt in at any time, too. So th that's the same for the municipality itself? If the municipality has third-party accounts, sure. They, if it made sense, we do. in the comparison rate, then it could opt into the program. Could opt in? Yes. Or if you already have an agreement. If you don't have an agreement, then you can certainly take advantage of the program. You'd automatically get included. Typically, if you didn't the, have a third party. The, the advantage of the program, if it's cheaper. Yes. We yeah. don't know that yet. We don't, yeah, we wouldn't know until we actually go out to the marketplace. Yeah. 
Does it cover just electricity, or does it cover gas too? It CCA can be used for gas, okay. but of the more than 150 municipalities in the state that have enabled local laws, none of them that I know of are pursuing it for gas. Okay. It, everyone has been focused on, and it's the reason the state is promoting it, is as a vehicle to transform the electric grid. But it can be sure. used for gas. And then uh, meters on home. So uh, is it the consumer's responsibility since, like, let's say, for instance, I have ONR now, I have an ONR new meter on my house, I, you folks come in, the, the village okays the two-year plan, me as a consumer, that's their meter, technically, correct? It, and it stays their meter, too. See, the relationship, this is something that does not affect any of the delivery aspects of, of ONR's business model. Okay. So part of delivery is the, the poles and wires, mm -hmm. the transfer station, the meter on there, and the billing, okay. and the repair service if there's, if there's storm damage. All of that stays unaffected. So my I mean, bill still coming from ONR. Bill still comes from ONR. This yeah. is a, if you do the program, this is a line item change. In this, there's a delivery charges section, and there's supply charges section. If the utility is making your choice, there's typically three line items. Mm -hmm. If the program goes forward in the community, it's just one line item with just a rate, but it's still on the ONR bill. Okay. Who, who sets the rates for the program? Mm -hmm. It's a decision that's, um, it's step eight when we get there, okay. that there's a request for proposals issued by the, by the partnership to the suppliers in the marketplace, and the suppliers bid it. And the town, typically through a, an agreement that they signed an MOU going into the RFP, says we're not going forward unless our, our criteria are met, that we get a 100% renewable option. Maybe we want a second option that's not 100% renewable, that might be less cost that we're not going forward unless it beats the 24-month benchmark from the utility. So unless it's a cost savings, we're not going to proceed. All of that is in the MOU okay. with that understanding. And that's when the rates come in, the team evaluates them, and picks the one that makes the most sense. Thank you. Uh, last question, sorry. No, no trouble. What's stopping a consumer now locally from getting their supply from O&R, from renewable energy? They have that opportunity. Nothing's stopping them. Um, they may, like I said, they may not get as good a rate as you can do through this buying club, but nothing is stopping them except <laughs> that it's often overwhelming. Um, there's typically not more than 10 to 15 percent of an average community that is in a third-party contract in supply marketplace so for various reasons. The only real way we get the benefit is if we get a good number of folks to sign on. It that's, that answering this question over here, it sort of happens automatically. If the community goes forward with it, feels comfortable going forward with it, the, the utility data that comes, the, the anonymous utility data for the communities that are aggregated together, that is what the suppliers bid on. And they know that there's a certain dropout rate. And so that's what they bid on and give the favorable rate. So after the program launches, there's no requirement to keep people in the program. And there's, you know, there's no restriction to stay in the program. So there's no threshold that they have to maintain. So there's no pressure to, to, for the municipality to maintain something make sure it happens. It just has to be something that works at the start of the program, that there are sufficient numbers. So, so give me a very short answer on this yes. question or comment that I have. Yes. Why, why do we, I had a guy at my door last week, two different days, the same guy, because yeah. he didn't like the answer the first time. So he came back the second time, he was a gentleman, yes. trying to do the same thing, you're trying to sell me something to make my electricity cheaper. He looked at my bill, he said, I can save you $15. What's this, what, why does the village, you keep saying town, why does the village have to sign on? Be the, be the, uh, be, why does government have to tell people? Why can't the folks, my neighbors, pick who they want? What, what's, what's in it, what's in it for the village government or the village resident by doing it this way versus the guy that was knocking on my door. Perfect follow-on to this, where there's a small percentage short answer. that takes advantage of it. Short answer. Mm -hmm. So it's, the, it's, it's a decision-making gift. That's my short answer. The decision-making is too challenging. So you want the village to decide for m m our neighbors? For the residents of your... My neighbors. Sure, yes, in that regard. Well, you, you, I mean, give, you give more buying power. 
Right, it's a buying power to okay. and, and, and it's not the village per se. It's not you, Joe, saying, you know, that you, Merv, have to do this. It, you know, there's a committee that's formed of the residents that look at the data, that, you know, put work on the bids, select the administrator, are really involved in the whole process. So it's all very transparent. It's not a dictating. It's, it's working together to try to get this good price on renewable energy to our community. One thing that there's Consumer Reports magazine, just, you know, this apolitical, just consumer, they do consumer advocacy. October 2018, they did a survey that is representative of so many other surveys where they surveyed Americans, red state, blue state, across the board, and they asked people how their feelings about renewable energy. The findings, 75% of Americans want renewable energy, say we should be doing renewable energy. 60% said they'd pay more for it. They'd pay $60, like $5 a month more for it. You, you know, and that's robust findings, a great survey. Again, like not more than 10 to 15 percent of a community gets over the hurdle of understanding the, the opportunities that are people banging on their door about, and they have to get into a contract for that too. So the idea of this is it's a way that the town can really gift decision-making bur burden reduction for their community to deliver what they want and give that win-win scenario. So it's a reason Which for... Which we don't it. know yet. Which but, we don't know that to be. But yeah. you, but you wouldn't have to proceed unless you got what you wanted. Yeah. Okay. There's a couple more questions. I'm sorry. Last no. Uh, real last question. Real no, quick. that's all right. The so, 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 let's say Village Hall falls 1,200 homes, and I take out the ones that are blocked, and they're in the contract, yep. and all that stuff. So, if there's 150 homes that decide to sign on, just hypothetically, it, when I enter into this two-year contract, am I in the buying power with the 55,000 other homes, or am You're, I just for here? It would be with other communities in so the I'm aggregation. Part of that 55, not necessarily that fifty-five thousand, but there will be a minimum, and based on the community, there would be a minimum of twenty thousand other households in the other communities collectively. And we're looking part at of my, part of my part of your price. A part of your yes. Okay. So I try to look at both sides of the issues, and when uh, Ms. Anderson first brought it up to me, and she'll let you know, I was really skeptical about it uh, because I don't like government telling me what I have to do or what I have to buy, but. I sat down, I did my research, I listened, um, and I understand why it is a program that is an opt-out. I would have rather seen an opt-in, but after doing research, I understand why it's an opt-out now. Um, now, again, it's like buying power, just like uh, Todd said over here. Uh, when the whole community gets into it, there is, it's like Costco, like you said, that much buying power. Um, the, the only thing there is, we're opting out. And if you go back to uh, uh, Mr. DeSalvo's uh, question, um, you would have to have a thousand people opt out, which I don't think, based on the surveys, would happen at this point in time. Uh, but if a thousand residents did opt out, uh, how would that affect that bottom line for the other people that want to go in if the municipality was to go for If the, as long as, because the opting out can't happen until the program launches. So the total population of eligible customers are in to start with. And so after the program launches, if a thousand, and during an opt out period where there's kind of like no, no harm, no foul, if a thousand opted out, there's no impact on the other 200 because the supplier enters into this knowing that they, that they have to supply whoever stays in the program. That's great. And, and uh, like I said, after doing my research, you know, I'm all for as much green energy as we can produce. Um, so. And not least is, is it's overwhelming for so many people to make so many decisions that we have to do. So many people don't want to think about this. And, and they also don't want to be restricted into contracts on the external opportunity. So it is really a benefit that comes with a lot of protections from decision making. Plus, the additional benefit that I talked about consumer price is having a team to parse through the options. So that guy who knocked on your door might have been talking about supply dollars, but he also might have been talking about community solar, which is another thing that people... So having a team to be your kind of like your energy experts and doing education can be very helpful to the community to just parse through all the opportunities out there. All right, bring us to what's our next step.
So that's exactly second to last slide. And so I'll just go quickly. So the team, Jewel is the administrator. They're one of the four state approved administrators, filed a plan. I'm their partner, nonprofit, Hudson Valley Energy. These two slides are the, pro the partner slides. The top slide on the top of page two, Hudson Valley Community Power Program. That's the 10 communities that are shown there that are partners with Jewel as the administrator, my organization as a, as a program manager, Direct Energy we picked as the supplier, and Central Hudson. The, the Rockland Community Power Program we just launched in October of this year, six communities, um, about 30,000 households. We picked Constellation Energy there. And then the last, second to last slide is the process slide. There's 12 steps. The first step is adopting an enabling law, an enabling local law, which um, you'll notice that I've circled or I put in a box steps 8 through 12. 8 through 12 are the, you're expected to go forward with the program. Steps 1 through 7, there's no commitment. It's just exploration to see if this makes sense. So first step, adopt a local law, and there's lots of simple templates out there for that. The second step is choosing how to administer the program, which might be selecting the administ you know, an administration team. And then there is required public outreach, approval by the states, the data leading to issuing step seven, a request for proposals, which we've talked about a great deal about. That's how we get the supply rate. After that, if something works, if a, if a bid comes back that meets the criteria, then it's step eight, that we award the RP and we move forward to launch the program. Mr. Mayor, could I ask a question? And I might have missed this, I apologize for being late. How is the administrator paid? It's baked into the supply rate that the suppliers bid to be in the program. They have to include eight one hundredths of a cent in that supply rate that the administrator and, and they, that's how they pay us, the, the nonprofit, to, to be the support team. That has to include that, that administration fee and still meet the criteria, still be less than the benchmark of the average of people who pay the utility and still be 100% renewable. So it really is all baked in there. Orange and Rockland cannot charge any more for their supplier fee. They cannot. They would not be, yeah, they have to go to the state for any a rate case, for any changes they want to do for their delivery, and they would never be awarded as a, you know, for some compensation. But again, this is, a, this is not any impact on their business model because they don't make money, they can't make money on the supply. So let me just ask a quick question. I see you have some, like, you know, Clarkstown, Village of Havistur. These are big communities. What was, what was the length of the process time to, to get everyone, you know, like, okay, hey, you know what, I think we're going to decide to do this. What, what's the process of this? The, the, how long, what is the length of that? We, on this chart, too, we show it's, a, it, you know, in an idealized, or, you know, even someone conservative, it's about 10 months from about passing a local law to the, the launch of the program. can be done easily in 10 months. In about 10 months. And no communities in Orange County have signed up. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. This could be the could first. Be first. This could be the first. <laughs> yeah. So would we be part of the Rockland Community Power? No. <clears throat> I could say kind of definitively you would not. If you chose to go forward and with some expediency to launch something this year, Rockland Community just launched in October of 2020, and they've got a two-year contract. Okay. They're, we are forming an aggregation, and I could say Sogarty's Town and Village. So we've worked with a lot of town and village combinations, too, which is interesting. Uh, but Sogarty's Town and Village, um, Gardner, which is in Ulster, um, uh, and a couple of other communities are very close, but I wanted to mention their names. These are the other, like, size. Well, that could be a third aggregation, but we're coming up on the two-year anniversary in the middle of 2021 for the Hudson Valley Community Power Program. So there is, I've learned there's lots of ways to slice these things. It is possible that those communities I just mentioned, and if you guys decide to proceed forward, could be part of the new version of the of the of the Hudson Valley Community Power Partnership, so it could be that thirty thousand households plus another maybe twenty thousand households that we're assembling. And the only reason I ask that is because I see Central Hudson uh, supplier for the Hudson Valley Community One in Rockland has the ONR, and in this general area uh, we get our electric from ONR. They, there, I used to think that there was that kind of restriction, that the aggregation had to be within one utility company. When I first started working with CCA, but again, to use that phrase, there's lots of ways to skin this. And even when the first program, the, the pilot program, right after this was enabled in New York in 2016, 
20 communities in Westchester launched the pilot program. And that those 20 communities covered with predominantly Con Ed territory, but included a number of NYSEG communities. And so from a supplier perspective, they don't need to be in just one utility territory. They like seeing the statewide activities. And so they want to work with the Jewel team and their communities because they know the Jewel team is going to bring a lot of communities together. And so they'll give very favorable rates in both utility territories. So it's not, it wouldn't even be unusual that we might do a, a NYSEG, Con Ed, um, Central Hudson, or, you know, there could be a, a three or four combination coverage, and the suppliers would bid on that very, you know, very happily. Okay. Thank you for all this time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, I will. Yeah. <laughs> I've got examples of local laws and is this agreements. Is this, uh, is this you back here? What's your first name? It's Jeff Demansky. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, it's right here. Okay. I thought it was Glenn. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Very well done. I'll give it to the gentleman back there. Thank you, Olin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next, um, Todd, you want to speak to us about a uh, uh, couple of things. I know the water lines that I believe need to be replaced in Ondior. Yep. So, I'll start off, uh, I know we had this discussion uh, last uh, month on your uh, park. We're looking down there. Um, well, let's go back a little bit. 2016, I think it was, the village had put out a bond um, resolution for uh, uh, water improvements within the uh, village. Approximately $3.4 million was put in the resolution. At that time, um, it, no project uh, moved forward, per se. Um, that bond, is, uh, is the resolution is still valid. Um, I, we talked with Ralph, the treasurer, and made sure that that, that could be could move forward in any in the manner uh, the village is looking to do. One of the options we looked at right now is on your Park. I know Mr. Remus has brought up some issues above and beyond the water there. Uh, I looked at some uh, different things down there as well between the water, wastewater, and sewer. Um, but right now we have the I guess the ability I'll say to move forward with the portable water design down there. Uh, it's approximately get my numbers out. You're looking at 3,600 linear feet of new 8-inch ductile iron main, about 4,000 linear feet of new 1-inch copper um, to the houses. Uh, we're looking at between a contingency, engineering costs, you're looking at a cost uh, to construct of approximately $1.7 million. Um, I think the mayor, I think we provided that to everybody, there's a proposal as well to move forward with the engineering if you see fit to, uh, to do so. I've already reached out to three different surveying companies as well as aerial mapping companies to get proposals, which I should have here uh, probably midweek next week to get to the board. Uh, we will need to do the aerial mapping as well as surveying uh, controls, uh, the delineation of all uh, subsurface utilities prior to doing that surveying work as well. Um, but when it comes down to it, I think that uh, in order to to, to We'll say fix the infrastructure issues within the Ontario Park where we have substandard water mains. Uh, currently, the water main dimension is six inch minimum for mains. Those mains are all three inches max. And of those three inches, if you see the lines are downstairs that we pulled out of the ground, uh, some of them probably have less than one inch actually remaining within the pipe. We've had uh, four leaks, I think, in the last three years in that area with the water, I'm concerned the water, and three leaks or collapses to the sewer main uh, within the area. So what we're proposing is to do a complete replacement in the same location with new water mains, uh, allowing us to stay in areas that have already been, where rocks already been removed. Um, we would have to install, as, which is included in this number, temporary water system to, uh, you know, one road, rip out what's there, put in new, and then make the, re the new connections. Uh, so it, it's, a pretty, uh, it's a pretty intricate um, design and pretty intricate construction that would take place in order to limit the amount of rock that would have to be removed. I think we're all familiar with that area. There's a lot of rock in the ground over there. So going where the lines up currently are is going to be a lot cheaper than going uh, in, in a new location. Um, so we put together those numbers, discussed them with the treasurer. We have, uh, the treasurer had no issue with, uh, with those numbers. I think there's also a, uh, I'll call it a surplus in the water department and the water fund as well. I don't know exactly what that number is, but I know it's uh, it's substantial. Um, 
but when it comes down to it, I think it's something that uh, we should look at moving forward uh, as phase one of improvements. Phase two would probably be Craxton doing the same thing because the, the lines are of equal age there. And then phase three is potentially satellite, um, satellite, satellite Grove. Grove. Satellite Grove. Uh, right now, though, looking at Fondiora would be the first, uh, first place, I think, where we know we have some major water quality issues as well as uh, some capacity issues. Well, well, we know we have a capacity issue also going to Craigson, so why would that not be included in phase one? Uh, we we could do for, that. I, 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 um, I hear you. I ran the numbers actually today on that. So Craigston is comprised of uh, 3,825 linear feet of would be new 8 inch ductile iron main, 3,600 linear feet of new 1 inch copper for house connections, and 400 linear feet of new 2 inch copper to the go down to the plant, to the wastewater treatment plant. When you run through all the numbers on that, and you get an estimated cost of 1.811 million. So 1.811359. Um, so really the question there is if you combine the two, you're right at your bonding limit. Uh, that was you know, put out in resolution. For so, water. For water, yes. So uh, Todd, I appreciate you. I'd ask you to get the numbers for practice so we would know. But, uh, and as you just said, it puts us right at our limit. Correct. Uh, um, I, I, bid the, I, I put those numbers together, though, meaning that there are two separate jobs. I understand. So if they're pulled together, the number should come down, but it's, still, it's still close to the limit. So, so I had, uh, I had uh, asked uh, the highway department and the water department to uh, find two locations in Craigston. I want to look at the pipe. Yep. We haven't done that yet. It's probably going to be what you're saying, but I think we should look at it at the same time. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I brought this up at the last meeting. Um, so the gas lines go to the Hacienda. Correct. That, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And to continue them on, being with all of the digging that's going to take place, is that something worth... That's a possibility if the timing, it's all, some of it, some of it's timing. The folks in Andiora Park have been, uh, and, and, and uh, also across the street, um, have been sent a, a letter survey, okay. and I hope they're answering it. I know several that want to switch over. Um, I, of course, some won't. You know, they don't, they like what they have, whatever that might be. And, um, but they, if they do put lines in there and we can work it out. I mean, that uh, would be great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, well, we'd also look at, we, we actually, the mayor and I brought that question when we started looking on your park to Central Hudson, because Central Hudson, based on the other roads that we worked with them on, where they, they actually offset a lot of our paving costs on those roads. So we were actually trying to see if they would put gas to help the residents out, as well as to offset some of our paving costs. So at, and you're saying at their expense? Everything's at their expense, yeah. Right, and that's that's something that should be brought out. Yes. You know, you know what I mean? That that's. That's at their expense to do that. That would be great. Yeah, I, we, we looked at both, uh, well, we looked at all three areas. So we looked at Andorra Park, Cragston, and Satterley. They came back and already said that there, there's no way to get to Cragston. It's too far to put a main in just to, to try to go through Cragston. Right. Um, so they were not interested in doing that, but they're definitely, Central Hudson's interested, and they jumped right on it, and they got on Andorra uh, on, on on and Satterley. Did you tell them about Regina Road? I, I did, but we're going to talk to them again tomorrow about that. Right. About that so. Well, that's good news. So, uh, another question. Um, I noticed in uh, your bid package, there is the individual lines to the houses. Correct. Now, when we did the North End, 20-some mm -hmm. years ago, uh, the individual lines to the houses weren't done. Correct. But we're going to do them now. Wait, Hold on, wait, okay. wait. And when we have a leak, beyond the curb stop, the homeowner, who just had some leaks, is responsible for that. But now we're going to put in all the lines to the houses. I, I he, hear me out on this. The reason I put that in there, and the mayor brought the same question up when I first put it in. We have, uh, down there, you have galvanized lines throughout. So what I'm concerned about doing is that if we fix everything to the curb stop, which would be the curb shutoff valve, and not onto the private properties, 
we're still going to have a water quality issue and we're still going to have long-term leaks. We're trying to eliminate leaks right now. We're trying to find about 130,000 gallons a day uh, of water. Um, so I believe that we have a lot of leaks in those lines. Um, I think that we could still reiterate to everybody that we're, we're replacing these lines, but as soon as it's in the ground, accepted it and signed off and inspected, that from the curb stop to the house still is the ownership of the, of the property. Um, that, that's what the code says, and, and that's what we, we can go by. We can make the decision not to do those lines if you, if you wish, but I think it's going to result in not finding some leaks that are out there and, and not correcting the water quality issue because we'll still be getting that rusty, flaky, we uh, rusty water off out of those lines potentially. So when we do put these uh, individual <coughs> lines into the houses, um, have you included the re-landscaping yes. of the area? So that's in that Yes, package. it is, yep. Okay. Yep. Now obviously, we, we're going to want to go where the line currently is. If somebody put a huge garden over top of it, we might have to maneuver left or right to get to, to, the, to the area. Uh, we don't want to you know, rip out stuff that could increase the cost for that landscaping. But uh, right now we But it's in the package. It's in the package, yes. Jeff, so your total cost for this is sewer and water line? That's just water. This is just water. Yeah, just water, yeah. And your total cost for, let's just say, the Ondura Park area? Just on your Park is uh, $1.7 million. Okay, what's your contingency in that one point? Ten percent. Ten percent? Yep. And is there any separate for rock removal? Or is that part of your ten percent? The, 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 no, the rock removal, there is a small amount of rock removal, which was a, a foot and a half, a, a foot and a half or two feet of depth, because I'm concerned that they don't actually have a full four foot of depth clearance on the existing uh, line that's out there. Okay. So if you have a three inch pipe that's sitting three feet down, we are going to go to an eight inch pipe. So you got to add five inches there and then another foot. So I had a foot and a half of additional depth of rock removal. Okay. So copper. Uh, that would be ductile iron, and the copper would be the house connections. Okay. Only because I just replaced some copper in my house. Okay. Well, tell me why copper. Uh, I'm not against it, I just, why copper? Oh, for, for the house connection? Mm -hmm. That's industry standard now. Copper, K-copper is industry there's standard. There's no other, there's no other, nothing else out you, there. there. There is. You can go out to, you can go off to the plastics at that point, but then it'd be, it'd defeat the purpose to use the plastic line for the house uh, services and not go to a blue group, which would be a plastic pipe, uh, your, but your code doesn't allow that. Okay, what's the life expectancy of the copper? The life expectancy of a K-copper for a house connection at three-quarter inch or one inch should be 40 to 50 years. The life expectancy of the same thing in a, in a polyethylene or, or whatnot is well over 100 years. If you really want to get technical on these and go, you, you would have to look at potentially changing your code because your code requires these things right now. These, All right, so that's a code change. One way, correct, and one way to reduce the cost on this is to potentially go to a blue brew pipe, which is still AWWA yeah. approved. It reduces the cost probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 15%. 15% uh, reduction. Yep, 15%. If we change the code to go to a plastic. Correct. And then, so you, you, why wouldn't we big, do that? That's the latest chunk of money. Yeah, it is. Will you write that down? Yeah, I did. Yep. But, so, but, so that's but, replacing but, the iron ductile and the copper. Yeah, that's replacing the iron, Just that's just replacing the ductile with, okay. with, with the blue roof. And that, the blue roof. that plastic pipe now is, is the length, the life expectancy of that as good as the iron ductile? It's, it's longer. It's longer, yeah. okay. And that's just for the main? Just yeah. for the main, yes. So, so we're still using copper for the connection. So just, just right. typically you would, yes. Just a, just a quick question. You're saying that the, the length is more, but how about the strength? The strength is the same. It's actually, is it, if yeah. you go and look at it, they, they meet all the same requirements uh, that the C900 uh, okay. design requirements for AWWA. So AS, ASTM requirements and everything, it's the same. It's actually a piece of pipe, it's plastic pipe that's made to the same outside dimensions. Uh, it, it's the, the same outside dimensions to duct iron pipes. So, what about the it, 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 the um, the placement of it though? Is it is it are there any requirements for placing the plastic versus the iron ductile? I mean, is do you have to dig a bigger hole? Is it? Is it's it, actually easier to install. That's why the cost comes okay. down because it weighs less, yeah. and you can you can actually control. Good. 
Well, I, I, have to, I have to tell you. There's a better deflection. Than it. Correct. Because I have to tell you that the the water system that's in uh, mm. Fort Montgomery, the town of Highlands, mm -hmm. uh, District Two, I guess it would be, uh, all of District Two, because well, we designed it and installed it, is all that yeah. pipe, blue blue pipe they call it. It's a plastic. Didn't pipe. we approve that? And and you did approve that within that district only. Right. So we would have to go to the, the same you know review right. that law. And yeah, I, re I remember that meeting because. Mr. D'Onofrio, you were there, and Kevin, Mr. Hurst was there, and we had to, we were figuring out how to trace the plastic, and we had to put the copper lead wire on top right. of the plastic. So there is a copper lead wire that goes on top, and as well as uh, so, the tape that goes on top. Of so the with the potential, should we be able to change the law with a 15% savings? Yep. Potentially, I'm not mm -hmm. going to hold you to any of these numbers. On there a park, as most of the board will know, uh, just a little quick little sidestep since we are going to potentially be opening up the road and servicing those, mm -hmm. those, those homes. I know in a couple sections, and I don't know if you can, you can limit it to a couple sec sections, where there's some huge drainage issues. Yes, we I mean, a, a couple pictures. We talked, of, we talked about Yeah, a couple yeah. pictures mm -hmm. uh, I, I saw of a yeah. small lake. So I don't know if that can be addressed since the potential for the 15 savings. If we switch to this plastic pipe, there may be monies in there. That, dollars. that is correct. Remember, though, your savings, you have different, in my, I, mm. I believe it's correct, your savings would be on water if the, the storm water would potentially be a general fund cost. Yeah, no, no. Okay. Yeah, listen, no, but it's yeah. point, it's point to yeah. point. It, no, it, it's, it's a great point. It's all coming out of the same pockets. If, so. you take, if, you take, if you take 15 percent off of 3.5 million dollars, I mean, that, that's what, it's close to half a million dollars. Well, yeah. so. If you did, let, if you let, let's or if you let's didn't. stay with. I would appreciate if we could just stay with figures for on the arc. Yeah, right? I'm just talking on. Not so, the three point so five. Two hundred. You're, that you're in Craxton at the moment. You save two hundred thirty thousand dollars. Okay. Roughly. All right. So so the drainage is. is we, we've talked about the drainage, and uh, that's a good question. And there's, you know, it depends on what the term couple means to you. A couple to me means two. There's probably more than a couple spots. But there are some spots where I want the folks to know that the state road out front that goes past Hacienda and the funeral home, that belongs to New York State, that water that lands on their road drops into a storm basin, comes across the street, and dumps into Ondeora Park. Mm -hmm. And that's been a bone of contention and a right contention for those folks where, that it's affecting. Mm -hmm. Minority number of who it's affecting, but it's affecting. But that's something we're going to look at. I agree with that. Same thing happens on MERS, which we've had to deal with up there coming off of yeah, Okay, so real quick, and I know, and I don't disagree with what Mr. D is saying about looking at Ondera Park, but you know as well as I know mm -hmm. that if there's a potential for this little bit of savings on the bigger number, and we're going to have everybody mobilized here, I'm just thinking price wise, we should probably just look at it, uh, especially with. You know, lower rates now, take advantage, the potential, if it can fit in that number. I know this is probably sounding a little different than I normally do because I'm always <laughs> freaking out about spending money. But uh, if the need is great enough and it's there and it seems to make sense, the only conversation I'd like to have with the treasurer is how we're forecasting how to pay for it mm -hmm. without hitting taxpayers over the head. So I, I would just say let's be open a little bit about it just because of price, timing, setup. I don't know. So well, you're, 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 I don't want to so pay you're saying do the, do the actual stormwater improvements? It, no, no, see, Craxton. Oh, Craxton. Okay, are, them, gotcha. uh, yeah. With this project, just because why pay mobilizing twice? Why pay? I, I'm just looking at it. Just suggestion. It's not just a suggestion. And, and that's where I thought you were going before. That's why I said it'd be over yeah. half a million dollars of savings. At well, that's what I'm saying. So if it's a half a million dollars, I don't know. I'm just just now, saying. just for the reason this is coming up tonight. Is, is because obviously it's winter and these next three months uh, the surveying, the aerial photos and all that you have to take and, the, the, and where all the other utilities are, this is the time of the year that's best to do it. Well, it's the best time to, to get design done right now so that we can get into a point where when we're ready with an approval that we're in the construction period. So if we wait till April or May and start doing this, then we're going to be in the next year by the time we, we do this, so, so with the construction. So on the aerial stone, mm -hmm. um, the last meeting you said you needed one foot yep. uh, because of the topography down there is relatively flat. 
I know we got plates from the county yep. that are two footers. Mm -hmm. I know you're going to have to do control and you're going to have to go out there and actually do the roads themselves yes. or uh, sections of them mm -hmm. for sure because you want to be dead on for that. Why can't we use the county two foot tow boat and try to save some money that way, especially with uh, the design programs that are out there? You can take that two foot tow boat and you can change it to one foot tow boat. Because the amount of time it would take to do that and not have the surety to know that it's actually correct, it would cost the same to have the aerial done and, so, the, new, and the new image done. So, so it's a surety. In my mind, yes, the surety is really key, especially if we're going to start looking at doing some sort of uh, stormwater improvements that right. we're going to be, we're going to need to know where we're at. I'll, I'll tell you, when we had that same uh, two-foot increments, or two-foot contours, and we were doing MERNs back in 2009, uh, Berry Hill, Oak, we tried to use it there, and it, was, it, doesn't, it, match. it doesn't match. It doesn't match with what's on the ground. I don't know if they didn't have enough control in this area or whatnot, but it wasn't it wasn't accurate enough for us to utilize that. We actually had to do the survey in order to make sure we didn't have any issues with our profiles for the stormwater and for the, the um, well, the stormwater that was being No, but. that's a great answer, and I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but as far as the, the drainage down there, some of that water that does come off of uh, the state highway did not create this problem in Ondeora. It didn't create this problem in Ondeora Park. This problem and on the or part for that problem. So I, if we're going to do it, we really need to look at it because the roads are going to get done mm -hmm. at the same time. Uh, and we're going to crown these roads into the people's... Uh, well, when we, do, when we do anything with the roads, and we've done this for the last two years, we haven't changed any crowns. We haven't changed anything. So we go so out there and take... So this problem will still be there. That problem will still be there, yes. So I would hope that we could look at that to try to avoid it if mm -hmm. we're going to do it. And then um, just one other quick thing. Uh, and I, and I'm, I'm definitely, uh, I can assume that sometime in the next probably four weeks or so, we should have another storm event, whether it be a snow and then a melt with a rain, that we could actually go out and see everything that you're seeing that you have right there depicted and know where our problem spots are in order to, to incorporate that into the design and see how we can affect each of those problems. That would be perfect. I mean, this was on Christmas Day, too. Yep. And this is uh, just one last quick point. This was on the other side of the road, in Saturday Road. Mm -hmm. This is on Cedar Lane. There was over a foot of water up there, uh, and it was right at these people's front door mm -hmm. on Christmas Day. That's not something you need to wake up to when you have kids, little kids or whatever, I, I believe, on Christmas Day. I believe, and in, in not, I believe though when, when those subdivisions were laid out, there was no review at that time or no concept of where the storm water was going to go. Probably. So, so something that we're going to need to look yeah, at, even we, if we it's do. just for that one street, yep. to pick up the water and get it out. that is coming there, because mm -hmm. I did notice there is a catch basin that hits down uh, near Laurel. Yep. Uh, that we could possibly tie into. Does it go so under nine down there in, in Nord and Ox? Or we're... That, I don't know where yeah. that goes, but I know there is some drainage there, but at the end of Cedar, there's mm -hmm. none. And All the right. water was like a river coming in there. All right, let's come back to what we're talking about as far as on your park and maybe cracks in. So you want to, before we move tonight, to allow to go into the next stages, mm -hmm. you want to meet with Ralph, is that what I'm hearing? Well, I think because the next time I schedule a meeting, let's let's all be there and ask the questions. Well, the only reason why I was out there that two minutes is for health issues, so yeah. that's why I didn't make it. But the, I, the only thing I want to know is just what would the numbers be different if we went to the other pipe, and then we have to figure out changing the wall. I, I think that you're looking at minimally a fifteen percent. That that's the minimum, so okay. a conservative number. You probably need more. Than yeah. That. So it's, if yeah. I can, if I believe what you, you're saying, you want me to price the whole thing up w with. With the whole thing being Craxton and I would break it, for me, for me, yeah. I would break it up on the order Craxton, and then because and yeah. you can always add those numbers together. So, so I have the numbers right now with Dr. Iron. I'll with do the numbers one. again right. for, with plastic. Yeah. And then as, soon as, as soon as we have the numbers, then I would just it's a, it, I can call them. I don't. We don't even have a meeting. Whatever you want to do, like I, I just need to know. Okay, so then let's try if if all this comes to in place. Let's try to have this on the agenda for the next meeting. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, trying to move forward. Before, you know, and if they, by Wednesday, you need another meeting. Sure. Well, you, you could even you could even hold them. How how long is it going to? How long do you think it would take you to get that together? To get the numbers? Yeah. By Wednesday, I'll have them to you. I mean, I don't then, think it take that long. We, we, okay, we, I'm, you give me give me the numbers. I'm going to give them to uh, Ralph. Okay. We can and then we, after Ralph has the numbers, I'll let you guys know. And anyone want to call him? After I give you the email, and Ralph's got the numbers, so I would, I, he'll know what you're talking about. I don't remember if it's a 30-year bond, a 40-year bond. I don't know. What's Water is typically 30, uh, max for capital um, improvements too. For capital improvements, yeah. Okay. Uh, Ralph will be. Uh, yeah, I just want to check. Just and Ralph check. will be able to give you some numbers. I know when Gene and yeah. I and the mayor talked to him the other day, he he was thinking, uh, which probably was Chris, Christmas or a little bit before Christmas, right? He was thinking that we'd probably be in the one to 1.2 percent. On, on oh yeah, I know about the rates. The rate on the word, and, and I know there's yeah. some bonding coming. That that was the table. Yeah, yeah. So I I, okay. I just yeah that's all. You I give said. me those numbers. I'll give get them to Ralph, mm -hmm. yeah. and then the board can call them. Okay, hey, Todd. The issues that have been raised, your company has dealt with those already, right? Has dealt with what, what issues? Well, the flood rates, you know. No, not not in Onewa yeah. Park, but yeah, no, we've done. No, but this, you've so, done yeah. that type of work. Oh before. yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. So, good. So, well, that's good to get rid of water. Right, <laughs> right. So, um, you know, I, well, I just, the key here, though, is if you're... I, I just think people need to know that, you know, we hired you for that reason. You know what you're doing. We can move, and we'll get the job done. We, we have to... The one thing that, that I'm thinking about now, though, is that if you do something with on your uh, with the water, I don't know, you didn't have anything from Craigston, right? Everything's kind of sloping there and going away. But if you do something on your, we really need to look at maybe not even do the work now, but we need to have a design potentially for a couple areas in Saturday because that water is actually going on there. Yeah. So it, it, that's going to be a different scope of work than... than there's one than section in Craxton, not to belabor this, one section in Craxton on Drury Lane where they have an issue. Okay. Yes. Uh, that goes back years ago. But yeah. uh, there's one section going down basically in the back of people's yards. Yeah. Okay. And they just, they, it, it, it valleys and then comes back up. And so that there's that one section there, you know, but that's... You know, yeah. it's something we should look at if we're looking at drainage in those areas. Mm -hmm. But I just, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm going to have to look at Saturday though as part of the drainage. No, no, no I understand. For but but, but Laurel and Laurel, Saturday is dumping. Yeah. It's going that way. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. All right. So. Uh, yes. Do right, you want me to look at the local law? Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. send you over the local law. And for the yeah. changing of the pipe. And I should be able to yeah. send you uh, the agreement that in, that was in uh, Water District yeah. Number Two, I believe it was. Where the village actually agreed to a different standards of the center. Is there any other? Well, we can take this offline, but is there anywhere else in the local law where we could make cha subtle changes, or is there any way to point to a uh, a statewide standard that gets updated so we don't have to change the local law every time something like this? We could just up? we could probably just go to the AWWA standard, which is the state code standard they use. You know, maybe well, we okay. just do just that. grab the one we approved. Well, correct. What, well, I think what Elise is trying to do is not have to change something again down the road. If we simply state that it's as long as the state's approves what the installation. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get it with that. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know what to do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. You're welcome. Um, I need you to stay for an issue that we're going to talk about in executive session. Okay. Um, public hearing uh, continues uh, on the. Uh, amending of chapter 235, which is a water code. Um, is there anyone here that has a comment tonight? I don't think so. So uh, I would ask tonight that we uh, now, tonight, close uh, with a motion that we close the public hearing on amending chapter 235. So moved. Second. Motion by Trustee DeSavo, second by Trustee Livesey. All in favor? Aye. All right. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Public hearing. New business. Approved minutes. We had uh, two sets of minutes. One was on December the 7th, 2020. And one is on de was on December 21, 2020. Motion. Second. Uh, was everyone here for both? I wasn't, but I, I read it. It looked good. Okay. I, okay. Okay, motion by motion. Lizzie and Trustee Tosavo. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion. Here at the meeting? Yeah, I don't think we can do that. Meeting, you, can, you, you can't vote. Uh, approve the minutes? Uh, Brian, you say. Okay, second. Okay, let's do this. I, I thought so. Uh, 
but we've done that. So let's have, do I have a motion to accept the minutes from December the 7th? Motion. Motion by Trustee Livesey, second by Trustee Hour. May I have roll call? Trustee Hour? Aye. Trustee Livesey? Aye. Trustee DeSalvo? I guess I'm staying. Trustee Ramos? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Mayor May I have a motion that we accept the minutes from December 21, 2020? Motion. Motion, Trustee Livesey? Second. Trustee Howard? Roll call. Trustee Howard? Aye. Trustee Livesey? Aye. Trustee DeSalvo? Staying. Trustee Ramos? Wait a minute. You weren't at both? I don't think so, no. I, I don't have my own. No. I know the 21st you weren't at. I don't think so. Okay. Aye. Right. Motion carries. Okay, next I have a resolution whereas the next village election for offices will be held on March 16, 2021. And whereas no person shall be entitled to vote in any village election whose name does not appear on the register of the election, election district in which he or she claims to be entitled to vote. And now therefore be it resolved that voting for the upcoming general village election shall be conducted at the Senior Citizen Center, 15 Drew Avenue from noon until 9 p.m. Be it further resolved that this resolution shall take place immediately, dated January the 4th, 2020. May I have a motion? Motion. Uh, 2021. 2021. Yeah. Motion. Sir, second. Second. May I have roll call? Trustee Albert? Aye. Trustee Lindsay? Aye. Trustee DeSalvo? Yes. Trustee Ramos? Aye. Mayor DiMaggio? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Uh, I'd like uh, the board to approve the appointment of Edward Dunn as a Reappointment to the Consolidated Planning Board. His term would end December 31, December 31st, 2025. Motion, Motion by Trustee Second. Lizzie. Second. Seconded by Trustee Ramos. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. And, and if I could say, Mr. Mayor, uh, I spoke with Mr. Don and I speak with the guys down there at the Planning Board. They do a great job on reviewing all the plans that come through there, uh, not only for the village, but for the town as well. Next, I have a proposal from the LA group, which is in your packet. This goes along with the $10,000 grant that uh, we received from Greenway to update our comprehensive plan, which I believe is 12 years old, um, and it really needs to be updated. Uh, it's a matching grant uh, to do the update, and uh, their services are there in your packet. Motion. Motion by Trustee Livesey. Is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee DeSalvo. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Next, I have bills and claims for fiscal year 2020-2021 of $130,078.25. Motion. Motion by Tr You reviewed the bills downstairs. I saw you today. I appreciate that. Yes, um, everyone signed the, the payment tonight before you leave. Is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Livesey. All in favor? I guess. Opposed? Motion carried. Not on your agenda uh, is uh, I'd like approval for Monday, January the 25th, that the Village Hall be closed and that the ladies downstairs will all be in, of course, uh, and working upstairs here to do um, um, record. record management, record keeping and they really have to come up here, all of them, and it's going to be, in, and it won't get done on the 25th, but they'll have a good start. Motion for the ladies. Motion for the ladies to work upstairs in the village hall to be closed on the 25th of January. Second. Seconded by Trustee Howard. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay. Um, before we go into executive session, throw out some numbers. The virus numbers aren't going down. So what we have here in Orange County as of today, 24,370 cases. 24,370. Since Christmas Eve, excuse me, since uh, New Year's Eve, four days ago, Orange County cases positive, 1,245. In the hospital right now, there's 168. There's over 20 of those folks that are on ventilators. Mm -hmm. 
And since New Year's Eve, which wasn't that long ago, 11 Orange County residents have died. 11. So if you think it's over, there are some folks that don't even think it can yet. They're denying there is a virus. That's hard to believe. You have people out there saying it's like the flu. Well, I don't think there's 11 people that died in the last four days in Orange County from the flu. If so, please correct me. But we need to wear the mask. Now, anyone needing mask in this community, please come and see me. I have 150 children's masks, pediatric masks. I have hand sanitizer. You just have to come and ask me, and then I'll make up a packet. Uh, Todd, the village engineer, and I will be meeting uh, in, I think it'll probably either be in Goshen or could be on uh, Zoom. That, that West Point study, study on uh, that advisory group that I'm a part of for electricity. Mm -hmm. So they've only had one meeting, but there's another meeting this month. I don't know. The county's been doing Zoom meetings, so that'll probably be. Correct. Okay. Uh, I am happy to report to the community that um, when the snowstorm came uh, last week, um, I issued a state of emergency. I did, it be, I did it because it was that bad, the storm was at night, the wind, the amount of snow, but I also did it keeping in mind uh, that there's a possibility there would be funds available if the storm was that bad for many people. And so I issued this uh, the state of emergency uh, to show that uh, it was bad here. And so from that now, um, FEMA, uh, the county notified me to come up with uh, figures and uh, we worked with the uh, uh, department heads and I uh, had the village attorney, uh, village uh, uh, engineer involved and um, we submitted papers to the county which will actually go to FEMA uh, for reimbursement uh, because of this state of emergency for $14,266. $14,266. And most of that was overtime uh, with some material, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the Greenway grant I did, um, the Trails Committee, which is the Scenic Hudson Committee for the ALO property, will be meeting this month with Scenic Hudson because we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago on site. Uh, it turned out for all of us that the property is better than any of, any of us thought. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, almost completely river view. I didn't expect that. Uh, and so uh, that meeting will be done um, with a conference call with everyone given the numbers. We're working on that, Gina. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to praise the uh, Highland Falls Fire Department along with the Fort Montgomery Fire Department and along with the Town of Highlands Ambulance Corps. Um, on Christmas night, Christmas morning, 3 a.m., I heard the fire whistle uh, go off. And uh, not that it's any different, but it just happened to be Christmas, early Christmas morning, 3 a.m., and then uh, during the day, early in the morning, the fire whistle went off again. I went to that call. Um, and then later on that day, the fire whistle went off again. And then I found out from Fort Montgomery uh, that they had gone out during Christmas Day. And then I had found out from the ambulance corps, of course, that they went out during the day. We're talking uh, close to 10 calls uh, from the three departments. Uh, all on Christmas Day, all when we're home, all when we're enjoying the heat of our homes and Christmas and the tree and the presents and dinner. These guys and ladies are running all over the community to put out fires. 
and to service people that need medical attention. So I can't say enough uh, about it. Uh, they're the best. Uh, uh, on the side of the fire truck at Holland Falls is a model that pertains to all, all the departments, uh, Fort Montgomery, Ambulance Corps, the pride of the Hudson. Think about that. The pride of the Hudson. I couldn't be more proud. Um, if you've seen the news of the Highlands this week, you'll, you, you saw last week you saw that Bog Meadow was at 93. Uh, that was before the snow and the rain. So um, uh, uh, I had um, my engineer do a rain dance. Um, it was odd, but he did it, and it worked. November <laughs> 7th. I mean, I'm so happy about this water. Now, if you've read the article, it's not over, because I never want to go through this again. It was bad. For two weeks, it was bad. I was scared. Worked on it, worked on it, worked on it. Almost every, not almost, every day we had a meeting about it, and, uh, Things were taken care of, and it did rain, and now we uh, have an abundance of water. And we're still not feeding off of bog meadow. We're still feeding off glycerin hollow. hollow. I'm assuming that might run for quite a few, quite, quite, uh, a few more days. Mm -hmm. So um, that's good news. But we're also going to talk about a couple of uh, additional uh, areas of uh, impounding more water. Okay? I want, I want that done before this happens again. And so, um, so we'll meet with the county. Uh, We're actually talking about that tomorrow, Mayor, with the uh, Schumacher at 11, 11 a.m. Okay. Um, here, I don't know how many of you can see this, especially on TV, but there's a little gadget in here, and a, what would you call that, Todd, sticking up there? It's, uh, it's, it goes into your nose. It goes into your nasal area. Okay, this is a Narcan. Okay, some of you are familiar with this. This little piece of equipment, or whatever we might want to call it, it's a spray. It's a nasal spray recently has saved, and I say saved, four lives here in the village of Holland Falls. Mm -hmm. You know this because of the ambulance corps. Mm -hmm. I know of four. It, there could be more. Mm -hmm. This, and when I say saved, if this wasn't used at the moment it was used, these folks were on their way. One person was actually blue. Now that's getting kind of close. And it, this immediately woke them up and got rid of most of what was in them, which is any, this can be used on anything that is, any drug that is derived from the poppy. In other words, not cocaine, not marijuana, but the poppy, heroin, opioids, which is the two drugs that are heavy now out there. This can be used, and it will save your life if it's done in proper timing. Mm -hmm. I don't follow fire department for people that I know of. You all have this on your, on your rig, of course. Okay. All right. My last thing is this. I'm going to take the mask off. Uh... This community, and, and many of you, probably everyone in this room has heard me praise this community. So I'm going to do it one more time. And uh, there's always, uh, there's really good times to do it, and here's a really good time. And this has to do with Christmas. This has to do with the holidays. And so, this is what this community does. And they do it so well. They do it so well. Uh, there was a, a family who came upon hard times two weeks before Christmas. 
I'm talking hard times. I'm not going to get into the specifics, but hard times is a little, putting it a little mild. That's how bad the hard time was. Two weeks before Christmas. No tree. No presents. We're talking young kids. We're talking uh, a partial family. I don't want to get into specifics. But here's what happened. And, and uh, my clerk back there has heard me say this year after year after year. I provide toys and gifts for kids who need. And there's always that last one that comes in. After I have distributed everything. It's just the way it is. It happens every year. Now where am I going to get? In years past, I've spent my own money. In years past, I've have found a toy here or a toy there. Uh, Brian Howard has helped me. This year, it was a little tough because these folks, these young people were not young kids, not toys, not coloring books. They were older, which is not something I get a lot of donations for because we think of kids, you know. A lady called me, and this happens every year, a lady called me from Fort Montgomery and said, Mayor, I have this, this, and this. Do you think you could use it? Well, you know where I'm going. It was for older kids. There was a pocketbook. There was perfume. There was lipstick. There were gloves. There was a, a hat. New, new. She solved that problem. Then, there's no Christmas tree. So what did I say to the highway guys? We had two trees in the front. You guys probably didn't even notice this. Christmas week, there was only one tree. <laughs> Someone stole the tree. And I know who got it. With the lights and all. That's Christmas. That's, you know, miracle. That's the stuff you see on Hallmark. I don't watch Hallmark. My wife does. But that's the kind of stuff you see on, on Hallmark. So now she had a tree. Now she had lights. Now she had presents. And, and another lady called and said, I want to provide food once a week to a family. And she wasn't talking about a small bag of food. Now the person who in need, I put them in contact with this person who had the offer, and every week she gives the, the lady her shopping list, and the lady goes and buys it. How much better? How much better? I would suggest no better. That's Holland Falls. The lady was from Fort Montgomery, the second lady. So Fort Montgomery. There's a case where we are one community. I'm in need, you help me. You're in need, I help you. This is good stuff. It doesn't get any better. Okay, that's enough for me. Let's go around the room, and then I would like a motion on personnel issues to go into executive session. Go ahead, sir. I contacted uh, Tom Osha. He's the Chamber of Commerce president. Uh, I'm asking that he meet with store owners. If you own the property, you're responsible for cleaning in the front, not just the path from the curb to the door. Um, we need to make sure that people can walk on the sidewalks after a storm. I got I received some calls at home saying that people had cleaned up their sidewalks, but the trucks came through and put more snow back. <laughs> They're not going to go back and clean the sidewalk, but some of the community, some of the blocks are now helping each other out. But we're not going to be sending the trucks back to clean the sidewalks. We don't have the, the manpower to do that. Uh, congratulations to Jim Modlin and Ty King that was sworn in on the first for the town council. Uh, thanks for the people who did the coat drive at the center. Boy Scouts up at West Point collected soap, socks, deodorant, razor blades for the homeless. And the families who adopted families at the center and then gave the toys up to the school district that they were passed out. Thank you so much for your generosity and thinking of others. Jim? Um, yeah, so real quick. Uh, January is uh, Solid Waste Recycling uh, It's an Awareness Month, so 
touching uh, some points about uh, what Joe said. Um, you need to come up with a plan. Everybody's throwing away way too much food nowadays. Uh, in 30 days, you can come up with a plan. 76 billion pounds of food are thrown away annually. Uh, that's a lot. It costs about each household, the average household, about $1,800 a year what they're throwing away. So what I'm asking uh, everybody to do out there, and there are some programs out there that will give you a little bit better advice on how to do it, is in the first week, recognize what food you're already throwing away. Are you buying too much milk? Are you buying too much vegetables? Are you buying too much meat? Are you, you know, is the package too much? Uh, maybe you should, when you have that extra, uh, maybe think about sharing it with a neighbor. Uh, but instead of throwing it away. But in that first week, try to recognize what you're overbuying. Uh, write it down. Uh, once you have that written down in the next week, try to develop a plan. Uh, you're going to start to set up your shopping list. Maybe it curbs down a little. Um, again, this is anything that can help to avoid waste. Uh, look for better ways to store your leftovers so they don't go bad as fast. In the third week, take the action. Now you're going to go to the store. Uh, have your list ready. You know, uh, buy a little less or buy a little more if you're starting to share it with somebody. And then in that fourth week, just reflect on how much you saved or how much you helped somebody. because. At 76 billion pounds of food a year, we're wasting a lot, and there's a lot of hungry people out there. That's what I got for today. Jim? Uh, sure. <clears throat> um, just a shout out to the uh, West Point Island Falls Rotary Club on two different things. One, we did bell ringing down at My Town Market. I want to thank My Town Market for allowing us to do that. And we were able on two days. Um, to collect over $800 that we sent to the Salvation Army. Nice. Um, and also, on uh, the second part, uh, we did do a coat drive too. Yep. And we collected about, it was eight bags, the 40 gallon bags. So I would say there's between seven to 10 coats in each bag. But I think what we'll end up doing is dropping them down to the center. And maybe you can just call me, Brian, tomorrow. We set up a day where I can bring those yeah. down. Um, and just to reiterate about you know the community coming together, I just want to do a shout out to uh, Chris Burns and all the folks who did the Christmas dinner this year. Uh, I guess they were able to take care of a lot of folks. I uh, wasn't able to attend. 175. Uh, yeah, 175. So a shout out to all the folks that come. I know he gets a lot of help. Um, so and all those folks that were there and helped out with that, uh, it was really really nice to see. Uh, that was all I had. Sure. I just want to say thank you to a lot, a lot of, there's so many people to say thank you uh, to this community because, you know, we always hear in these unprecedented times, um, we, you know, we're all going to get through this together. We've been hearing this for about nine months now, and I have to tell you that our community, uh, with these holidays that just passed, from the fire departments to the, you know, everybody participating in the festivities, um, bringing happiness out there to, to the mayor, the Christmas lights all through Main Street. I mean, it's really been something to, to make you smile and make you happy and make you, make you really believe that, that there's a good spirit here. And as we're going now, you know, we're, we're moving in a few days now. We're in 2021. And as the mayor has mentioned, the COVID is definitely still with us here. Um, you know, we still have to keep, you know, our, our guards up, but we have to keep, you know, motivated and we have to keep strong and we have to keep happy. And, you know, I want to thank this board here. You know, we, we've done a lot of accomplishments last year. Um, we're still continuing to move forward and, you know, we'll, we'll move forward on, on accomplishments. And, um, you know, it's tough times right now. It's tough for the businesses. It's tough for, for families that are out there, as the mayor said. I think that's just beautiful what he said before about the families. It's, it's just something that right now I, I'm, I'm going to try to speak for everybody here. I know on this board, if, if there is something that's out there that's hardship, um, that's why we're here. We're your servants, and that's why we're here representing the community. Um, 
and please don't ever be, you know, ashamed of, of dropping a line or putting a letter or coming by and saying hello. That's it. Thank you, Mark. Um, he hid this from me. You hid this from me. Uh, that today's your birthday. That's true, yes. So I owe you a cupcake and, and a my, candle. And my twin sister's birthday. Right? And your twin yeah. sister's birthday. We'll give her a candle and a yeah. cake. It's your birthday again? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, happy birthday, Brian. Thank you. Okay. Happy birthday, Brian. Uh, can I have a motion to go into executive session on personnel? Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you.